The following is a lecture given by Maurice Nicole on March the 9th, 1946. A note on the difficulties of giving out and receiving esoteric teaching. Tonight I will speak about the difficulties of esotericism, both from the point of view of its being given and of its being received. We might imagine human life on earth as comparable to some vast hotel into which air has to be blown to keep people alive. This ventilating system can be compared with the conscious circle of humanity trying to introduce air or spirit into the people in this enormous hotel. Otherwise, the people in this hotel would gradually die. Such a danger exists now. If this air were cut off, people would actually die. That is, if mankind were cut off from higher levels. In the Gospels, it is said that a man must be born of air. The word in the Greek for air or spirit is the same. In some of the ancient Gnostic writings, man is divided into different classes from the standpoint of esotericism, that is, into more or less mechanical. There is, for example, the harlic man, the lowest type of man, which we would call number one man. The word harlic comes from a Greek word meaning matter or wood. Such a man is a wooden man, a fairly good definition if you come to think of it. The next class was the pneumatic man, the air man. In the Greek the word pneuma means air or spirit. A pneumatic man is thus a man who has spiritual understanding as distinct from literal, material or wooden understanding. Such a man may perhaps see life spiritually as a combat between good and evil, rather than only as a means of gaining his own advantage. Perhaps he sees life as the will of man fighting against the spirit of evil in a universe of mystery. In any case, he sees life in a different way from the heilig or wooden man. We can understand Christ's words that a man must be born of spirit or air in the sense that he must come into an entirely new understanding. The work gives us a different view of life. In seeking to make us take ourselves and life in a new way, it is spiritual in that it seeks to transform us from the purely material standpoint. I will add here in parentheses that the Gnostic schools preceded the advent of Christ by one or more centuries and anticipated his coming, and that in the Gospels there are one or two purely Gnostic parables, such as that of the unjust steward. Gnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means simply knowledge. That is, it was a term that referred to certain schools of knowledge that were not purely material, i.e. not business schools. In this commentary I will use the term spiritual man in the Gnostic sense as distinct from a materially minded sense-based or wooden man. The trouble in using this term is that it has been so overused. As I said, through the work one can have a spiritual understanding about the meaning of life quite different from the literal wooden interpretation of life. Things have another meaning. In other words, we get to that point in which we realise that life as transmitted through our ears and sight is the outer appearance, not the reality of things. We spoke last time about the Hall of Turning Mirrors. Humanity rushes as it thinks forward. Actually, the mirrors turn and humanity goes round and round. This especially applies to the Heilig man who, so to speak, sees his future always in front and pursues this fantasy. He is immersed in life. He is identified with everything that happens in life. And so he takes life as it appears and so as an end in itself. But nothing in life is what it appears to be. Now the work teaches that the conscious circle of humanity are sowing into life spiritual ideas, namely ideas that separate us from the power of external life as seen, as read of every day in the papers, as experienced in our ordinary domestic situations. It has to make and keep going a connection through which higher influences can reach man asleep. There is another interpretation and through it another feeling of life and of one's own life which can begin through understanding this work, and this comes from the conscious circle of humanity, who give out influences different from life. 
where there is no vision, the people die. Today, when vision is ceasing, the power of external life, of machines and war increases. Man must serve one or the other. Without vision, without the influences from conscious man, humanity is enslaved by outer life. Because it has no inner life, having given up the idea of religion, it has nothing with which to resist outer life. When there is no inner life, one passes into the power of outer life completely. Man becomes helpless, a creature of mass movements, mass politics, of gigantic mass organisations. Certainly we can suppose that ants must have no inner life. Some people say, if there be such a thing as the conscious circle of humanity, why do they not appear openly and tell everyone exactly what to do? As a matter of fact, they have always been telling people what to do in different teachings and religions all through the ages, and some have appeared. But they cannot compel man, they cannot have police systems, they cannot force people to awaken by torture, because man is created a self-developing organism. Any religious system of force is at once a dead system. You cannot make a man awaken by external force or compulsion. A man can only begin to awaken from his own understanding and his own will to awaken, which begins when he sees his state. For that reason, the conscious circle of humanity is limited by higher laws than those on this earth. It has, therefore, to work indirectly. The forces of life can work directly and violently on people by means of police systems and guns and all the savagery that we have seen in this century and indeed throughout history on a smaller scale. But such compulsion does not wake a man internally, it does not lead to self-development, it does not make essence grow. I am saying all this in connection with what was said recently that we have to keep the work in a separate place in ourselves and guard it from the influences and appearances of life. This is impossible unless people understand eventually as much as they can of what this work teaches, otherwise they will fall into various deep pits of thinking derived from life and not from the work. They will say, why does not God or this so-called conscious circle help humanity? They will say, why is not something done straightforwardly and plainly why are not people told exactly what to do and made to do it? But a man can only grow through his own choice and his own understanding and from inside, because it is the individual man in himself, the essential man, that the work and all other esoteric systems seek to awaken. It is the internal, not the external man, that must grow. For this reason the work must be kept separate and guarded in our minds. I spoke recently about the foot and the eyes and what they mean psychologically, that is, esoterically. I said you must not let your hand touch your foot or shoes and carry mud up to your eyes, because this is sin. Sin meant originally in the Greek to miss the mark. The mud on your foot, the mud of life, must not be mixed up with your understanding of the work. We all lie mechanically, and so we do not accept it. This is mud on the feet. We all justify ourselves and think we do not. It remains dark to us. This is mud. Above all, we identify and never see it. We identify with our suffering. We feel undersized at one moment and oversized the next. We take our lives as they have turned out as our basis, what we rest upon in thinking or feeling what we are. This is mud. The wrong feeling of I is mud. We all take our self-merit as valuable. It is mud. We have many ideas of superiority. This is mud. Everything from false personality is mud. Every interpretation of life as appearance as seen without any transforming ideas is mud. Mud, therefore, is a long study. But I find it too difficult to give you a handbook on mud simply because mud is our way of taking life and its results on one's imagination of oneself and the work is something quite different. If we could see internally the meaning of our lives and the kind of people we are in the light, the consciousness of the work, if we could lift our level, if we could see what it means that we 
cannot do, then indeed we would see no longer merit on our feet but mud. The worst kind of mud is formed by various ways of thinking we can do, i.e. that we are right and by feeling merit for it. We spoke recently about suffering and how the work teaches us that we have nothing real to sacrifice save our suffering and indignation. That suffering, that negativeness, that long unchecked making of inner accounts of the results of internal considering, of not being rightly appreciated, all that is indeed mud in the light of the work. It is an Augean stable of filth through which a river of water must flow to cleanse it. River is water. Water is esoteric truth. It is still a curious matter how people take filth in the wrong way. I mean, they do not see the filth of their false personality, of merit, of superior feelings, of self-complacency. When a man feels the power of the work ideas, he begins to see internally. His inner sight opens and he then makes contact with the conscious circle of humanity. He receives influences different from those entering his senses from life, but he must keep his feet washed. When Christ washed the feet of his disciples, it meant that his teaching, if understood and followed, cleansed the external man, the external woman, from the mud of false personality. Try to bring the work into your minds when you feel negative and see what it means for yourselves to wash the feet. When a man feels the work and senses its meaning, the sight that he now has psychologically is different from the sight that he has had from the foot. He now sees Smith at his foot, so to speak. He sees the mud of his foot, but he must not lift that mud up to his eyes, which are viewing a different order of meaning, a different world, a different level of consciousness. There are many phrases in the Old Testament about this. I quote one passage. This is from Joshua, chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us, or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and did worship, and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Put off thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place where on thou stands is holy. And Joshua did so. So that was Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. This means that he lifted up his spiritual eyes and saw that he was confronted with a sword, i.e. that he was confronted with spiritual truth, which was contrary to the way he was trying to go. Sometimes we, we may have such an experience ourselves when we lift up our eyes in this sense. We may see that we are going quite contrary to the truth of this work, that we are going with our foot when we should go with our eyes. The very fact that he is told to look up he lifted up his eyes, means that he no longer looks down at his feet. He becomes aware of another path to follow, quite different from that which he would have followed if he had been looking downwards at his feet. Self-remembering is lifting up the eyes. David said in Psalm 121, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills whence cometh my help. To lift your eyes up in this work is to remember yourself i.e. to have insight into its meaning, because the spiritual eyes are inside, not outside. We speak in this work of the inner senses. When a man remembers himself, he gathers about him all the work that lies in him and all his understanding of it. This is his most supreme form of self-remembering. He then sees the issue with new eyes and all that the foot was muddy with, namely all that he was identified with and taken personally, all his life resentments and internal accounts and useless suffering and all the rest of it. All this vanishes as if it were nothing when seen through the spiritual eyes, the spiritual insight. From the standpoint of esotericism, we are all blind, looking down at our feet. When Christ heals the blind, it meant not merely something literal, but something psychological. 
Whereas I was blind, now I see. Paul had to be struck blind before he could see. This work is to make us see. One has first to see one's foot, so it begins with self-observation. Through Smith observing Smith, which is his foot, and separating, he enters possibly another range of influences and perhaps begins to make contact with the influences of this work. This is practical work. But he must be kept separate from the feet, and the mud of the feet must never be brought up by the hands to the eyes.